Everyone has a story. Everyone is an advocate or has the potential to be. And that we all run into these frictions in our care that can kind of spark a sense of needing to do something, needing to make a change. We're going to go back to our roadmap now and talk about crafting a message. So there are four C's in crafting a message. You want to make your message clear, credible, convincing, and concise. I want to look at an example from Project Cancerland. So Project Cancerland is an organization whose mission is to change the conversation around breast cancer to include honest voices and representations of how the disease impacts people. They have a campaign called This Is Not Pink. And I want to look at just one of their images and see what's working here. So this is one of their This Is Not Pink images. And I want to talk about strategically what's happening here. They have a real person. They have an image that's not seen every day. And their message is very concise. So there's no wasted words here. I want to take it one step further and look at what's beneath a successful message including that it's authentic, it speaks to the heart, uses a personal story, and it creates a balance of empathy and outrage. And I want to take a minute to talk about that, um, that last one. So outrage without empathy can lead to an exploitation or objectification of pain. Some folks refer to that as por pain porn, if you've ever heard that. So that's not an effective advocacy strategy because people feel powerless in the face of raw pain. And often fatigue will set in and they'll just turn away. So staying connected to empathy, which is different than petty, right, is really important in your advocacy work. Helps viewers relate to the situation and enables them to act from a place of recognition of, of our common humanity. So how do you make what you care about into an advocacy message? There are four things to consider. First, you want to consider your story. Decide how much of your story you are comfortable sharing. Right? You need to decide what's, what's for the public consumption and what's not about your experience. Along those same lines, you want to discuss your plans to share your story with your loved ones. It's important that they feel respected and that they feel like their privacy is being acknowledged and seen. I can speak to that later as someone who wrote a memoir um, that includes me and my partner. Lots of stuff come up around advocacy and, and relationships. Um, you also want to use data to strengthen your story. So what is your story a case of? How do you broaden it out so that people can say, yes, for instance, you know, referring back to that slide, the photo of the man with breast cancer, like what is his story, but what is he a case of, right? That men get breast cancer too, that they have needs that are often go unmet in this community. That's how you broaden that out, add some statistics, some research. Just, so just thinking about what is your story a case of? The second thing you want to be thinking about is audience. Who do you want to reach with your story? Do you want to reach other patients? Do you want to reach providers? Do you want to t reach lawmakers? Then you want to be thinking about what is your call to action? You wanted to, what do you want to hope to, or what do you hope to achieve? What do you want the listener or the viewer to do? And what are concrete steps that people can take? So one of the reasons I'm going to back up for a second, I'm going to go to like, I'm going to get all advanced in my PowerPoint. Hold on. One of the things I like about this slide, I'm going to back up. This is um, my friend Melissa made this slide or made this poster, is that it has a call to action that's very simple. She wants people to vote, right? 
So it gets across the message very quickly and very clearly about pre-existing conditions, something we all have, or most of us in this room. I can't say for everybody. And what do you want the person to do? You want them to vote. You just want them to think about that and take a concrete step, get themselves to the ballot box. The last thing, the fourth thing I'm going to talk about quickly is think about how to step back so others can step forward. And what do I mean by that? In social movement building and advocacy work, it's important to think about your position and how to be an ally to others. So you want to reflect on how your race, class, gender identity, sexual orientation, and ability influences and accesses, influences your access to safe, high quality, affordable health care. And if you're in a position of privilege, you want to think about how you can leverage your power to lift up the voices of people who are marginalized. Next stop on our roadmap, where to take your message. Once you've got a message, where are you going to go with it? We're lucky that we live in a time where there are more places than ever to take your message public. You can take it online, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, great places to build your breast cancer advocacy, get your message out to others who are doing similar work. You can take it to the streets. This is Kim Bowles, founder of the advocacy group Not Putting on a Shirt. Here she's striking a balance between empathy and outrage. You'll hear more about her and her work very soon. Spoiler alert, she's one of my guest stars. And finally, a little bit of shameless self-promotion, you can take it to the page. Um, these are three examples of my work. An article I did in Cosmo, an, art an essay I published in O Magazine, and a copy of my book. Um, three examples of traditional print media where you can take your advocacy work. I call this my introvert's approach to breast cancer advocacy. Because I get to advocate from my little writer's cave in Boston and do this work, which gets me to my next roadmap stop, which is how to identify your advocacy style. Everybody's different. No one type of advocacy is going to work for everyone. So I've identified three different advocacy styles I want to talk about. And these are just loose categories. Your advocacy may resemble bits and pieces of all three, and or you know you may have a lot of overlap. So just something to think about. The first style, flying solo. Everybody with me? PowerPoint moment. All right. So flying solo. I'm going to go through all three and then back up. Another. You can have group connection, small groups. You can also do national organizing. So out of these three, I'm going to talk for a minute about flying solo. I'm going to back up. can look like designing social media campaigns, lobbying, writing letters to, or postcards to lawmakers, writing essays or articles for media outlets. Small group connection can look like starting a Facebook group with like-minded advocates, or addressing an unmet need of breast cancer patients in your community. It can also look like teaching a class, a workshop, or mentoring other folks with breast cancer. National organizing can look like coordinating national summits and conferences, developing educational resources and tools, or lobbying for healthcare legislation. I'm going to have an example of each one of these. So this is an example of um, a little bit of guerrilla art, which is a type of solo advocacy work. This is something I did in 2012. When I saw this boobs for booze poster, how's that coming up? Can you guys see that? When I saw this booze for boobs poster in my neighborhood, I was pretty upset by such a hypersexualized illustration being used to advertise a breast cancer charity event. So I decided to make my own poster, on, and I walked around my neighborhood, and I posted my poster on top of or next to 
the Booze for Boobs event poster. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's really yeah. So this kind of solo advocacy work, it's small, but it's effective. And it feels good. Right? Yeah. So we're not talking about you don't have to do something big. You don't have to be overwhelmed by, I can't make a national conference like this one. You can make a poster and you can go out in your neighborhood. You can do what, you know, you see something, say something. So this is just one example of that. I do want to say I did get this nice woman's permission to use her photo in the poster that I made. I contacted her online, told her what I was doing, and said, would it be okay if I use this amazing picture of you to protest um, this event? And she was all on board and gave me permission, which was really sweet. This is my next example of a group connection. Oh, everybody in the audience, ah, Yeah, yeah. So Shay Sharp saw a need in her community. Women were dying of breast cancer, and their children needed support, especially around the holidays. One of the things she did was to make sure these children had a Christmas filled with love and support. She told me last night that every child on her list gets approximately 20 gifts each. These are not only toys and games, but they're clothes, they're shirts, pants, underwear, socks, things these kiddos need. And the idea being with not only do these kids get showered with love at Christmas, but their parents, or their parent or caregiver who has left is able to then take a deep breath and use that money to maybe sh spend it on daycare, bills, other things, because these folks really are strapped and they need our support. And Shay saw this need in her community. And she, s she saw that nobody else was stepping up to fill it. And so she did. Amazing work. Another example, quickly, National Organizing Young Survival Coalition. Of course, we wouldn't be here today without the advocacy work of national organizations like this one. So also a great place to plug in if your advocacy style looks more like go big or go home. Thanks.